with me, please, to the book of Lamentations. Lamentations. In Hebrew, the book of Lamentations is not called a book, but a scroll. Megillat Echa. Megillat Echa. And it sounds like somebody crying. It's the second book by the weeping prophet, Yermiyahu Hanabi, Jeremiah the prophet. Like all of Israel's prophets, Jeremiah is a type of Christ. Jeremiah is compared to a lamb at the slaughter, the same as Jesus. And when the message and preaching of Jeremiah were rejected, the first temple was destroyed on a day of the year called Tisha B'Av. It's roughly the 9th of August. Varies from year to year because they follow the lunar calendar, not a solar. So when Jeremiah's message was rejected, the first temple was destroyed, the Shah B'Av. And it was destroyed by the Babylonians. Babylon, in the days of Nimrod and Semiramis, is where false religion began. And the Babylonians destroyed the first temple, the Shah B'Av, after Jeremiah was rejected. Jeremiah was thrown into a cistern and left for dead, and they put a stone over it. The stone was removed, and he came out alive. But when he was rejected, the temple was destroyed, and the Jews were scattered. So too, Jesus was put in the tomb. The stone was removed, and he came out alive. But when his message was rejected, the second temple was destroyed the same day of the year, the Shabbat. Both the first and second temple were destroyed the same exact day of the year. Now, if you look at Peter's epistle, Peter closes his first epistle by writing, She who was in Babylon greets you. The early Christians associated Rome with Babylon. By the time of Jesus, the mystery religions that began in Babylon found their way through Asia Minor, particularly the city of Pergamum, into the Greco Roman world, and had their new home in the Pantheon of Rome. Hence, Rome was associated with Babylon by the early Christians, the woman on seven hills, and so forth. To Shabbat, both temples are destroyed. The same day of the year, Jeremiah foreshadowing what happened to Christ. And it's this day of the year, to Shabbat, when the Book of Lamentations is read in the synagogue to this day. It's a fast day for the Jews, and they read the Book of Lamentations, the scroll. Megillah Eha. This day, Tisha B'Av, is also when the Jews were expelled from England in the Middle Ages, on the King Edward. It is the same day of the year when the Spanish Inquisition was launched by Ferdinand and Isabel, and it's the same day of the year of the Kristallnacht in Berlin when the Holocaust began in the 1930s. And many other disasters of Jewish history took place that same day of the year when both temples were destroyed. We have to understand an eschatological paradigm. When the New Testament speaks of the last days, what it largely does is it recycles the themes from Jeremiah. From Jeremiah. Also from Isaiah, from Ezekiel, and from Joel, other prophets who prophesied before the captivity. But basically what I'm saying is this. What happened in the last days of Judah? Prefigures what happens in the last days, both to the Jews and to the church. One is a picture of the other. When you read Matthew 24, you see what Jeremiah was talking about. Jesus, first of all, begins by talking about the temple being destroyed, same as Jeremiah. Jesus goes on and on repeatedly about the false prophets deceiving the people. Straight out of the book of Jeremiah. When you get into the book of Revelation, you see these same themes. Fallen, fallen as Babylon the Great. Straight out of Jeremiah, straight out of Isaiah. The last days of Judah are a picture of the last days. And that will be important tonight when we look at the last revival from the book of Kings and Chronicles. The events of 720 and 721 BC, the fall of Samaria, <coughs> when the preaching of Hosea was rejected. 
are recapitulated in 585, 586 BC when the message of Jeremiah <coughs> is rejected. In 720, the women begin eating their babies. In Jeremiah, as we'll see in Lamentations, the women began eating their babies. The same events happen again in 70 AD. Josephus records it, that women would wait for a baby to be born so they would have something to eat. Midwives would literally fight over afterbirth so they would have something to eat. What happened in the fall of Samaria? What happened at the fall of Jerusalem? And what happened in 70 AD? All foreshadowed what's going to happen at the end of the world. If you want to know what the Great Tribulation will be like, one of the things to teach about is this. The Jews in 70 AD were in a situation where Titus inexplicably withdrew his siege temporarily. And under Simeon, the cousin of Jesus, the Jewish believers remembered what Jesus said when you see Jerusalem surrounded, flee to the mountains. They went to a place called Pila, not Petra, but Pila. After the Jewish believers of the Simeon escaped, which they thought was going to be the rapture, the Romans resumed the surrounding of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple. What happened inside Jerusalem after the believers escaped is recorded in Josephus. Now you see, if you were to read Wars of the Jews by Josephus, and you see what happened in Jerusalem after God's people were rescued, that teaches what's going to happen to those who missed the rapture. We will see a time again on the face of the earth where women will fight over it, waiting for a baby to be born, so we'll have something to eat. Well, they'll be arguing with the midwife. You take half and I'll take half. It's unthinkable, but that's what happened. It happened in 720, 585, 70 AD, and it will happen again. That's how bad the famine will become that we read about in the book of Revelation. These are unspeakable things. The idea, of course, is to be raptured. <laughs> if, if you're alive at that particular time. A is to B as B is to C. These events of 720, the fall of Samaria, the first fall of Jerusalem and the second fall of Jerusalem, all give us a picture of what the last days are going to be like in various ways. By far, the most depressing, miserable book in the Bible. I would have to say the most depressing, most miserable, saddest thing ever written in human history, arguably, is the book of Lamentations. Ecclesiastes is God's philosophy of life. And God's philosophy of life, he says, it's all vanity. But at least, he says at the end of it, love God and keep his commandments. That's his, don't trust in this world, it's futile to trust in it. Love God and keep his commandments. That's God's philosophy of life. But Lamentations opens and closes with the sheer misery in the aftermath of the events of 586 BC. It is hope that is God. Hope that is God. There is no longer any hope. Now we have to understand something. There are two different Hebrew words for hope. Two different Hebrew words entirely for hope. The first is Tikva. Tikva. That's the name of the Israeli national anthem. Tikva. Ha Tikva. The hope. We might translate it as aspiration. Aspiration. However, in the New Testament, we're given another definition of hope in Hebrews chapter 11. It is something entirely different and entirely different in character. Hope is the substance. Substance. It has substance. The New Testament understanding is future fact. Future fact. 
We're not talking about tikva. The Old Testament Hebrew equivalent of New Testament faith, future fact, is yechal. Yechal. Things get so bad in the last days, there's no more hope. Stop wishing things will, will improve. It's hopeless. There is no hope. The good old days were not that good to begin with, and they're not coming back anyhow, so forget about it. Okay? Forget about it. But there is Yechal. Yechal has a different meaning. Yechal has the idea to wait patiently in expectance, expectancy, with the connotation of it being difficult. There are two ways the Bible frequently, most frequently, expresses what it will be like as we wait the return of Christ. They come from the sciences of seismology and obstetrics, respectively. In the Pacific Rim, the earthquake belt, for people who live in Japan or California or New Zealand or somewhere like that, there's tremors. The tectonic plates begin to shift, the geologists tell us. And when it happens, people say, is this the big one? How high is it going to rip the scale? Oh, it's just a small one. Well, the small one tells you the big one is coming sooner or later. Countries, Japan, America, Russia, they spend fortunes on trying to predict earthquakes and can't do it. They get some indications from how frequently the tremors happen when it's coming sooner than later, but to pinpoint the date, nobody knows. When it's a tremor, I hope this isn't the big one. Well, okay, you can hope it's not the big one, and maybe it won't be. Maybe it will be under 7 or 7.5 on the Richter scale. But it's no point in hoping there's not going to be a big one sooner or later. <laughs> Sooner or later, there's going to be a big earthquake. That's all there is to it. Certain countries, cities like Osaka and San Francisco and then Wellington, New Zealand, sooner or later, something's going to happen. The other is obstetrics. Contractions in maternal labor become more frequent. They may let up for intermittent periods, but then they come back worse with more frequency. As dilation increases, the contractions become more frequent and they become more severe until the baby is born. There is no point in hoping that the contractions are going to go away. There's no point in hoping there won't be another contraction. There's no point. It's hopeless. It is absolutely hopeless. You're not going to stop the contractions. When this relates, this, you find this in Jeremiah, you find it in Revelation 12. There's no point, it, there's no way the contractions are going to stop. There will, however, at some point be a, a Caesarean section called the rapture. You understand? <laughs> to make an analogy. But, but it's hopeless to think the contractions are going to stop. The contractions may let up for in, 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 in periods, but then they'll come back again. This is what it says in Peter. Things will seem to get bad, then it will calm down. And people will say, you see, things have been the way they've always been since the time of our fathers. Jesus isn't coming. Peter warns people will say that. Oh, that's like saying, oh, it's only a tremor. The big earthquake's not going to come. Or, oh, it's only a contraction. <laughs> the water hasn't broken. <laughs> Don't worry about it. It's not going to happen. Well, it's, it's just not like that. These people are living delusionally during these intermittent periods where there seems to be an apparent respite. But then things get worse. For instance, when the Iron Curtain came down, people began saying stupid things, especially politicians who were stupid people. <laughs> they began saying, the world's going to get better. Now the Cold War is over. We don't have to live in the shadow of extermination of thermonuclear holocaust anymore. The Soviet Union has collapsed. 
Russia is going to make peace with the Western world. We don't have to worry anymore about China's turning capitalist. We don't have to worry anymore. That's what they said. They talked stupidly. Well, the Bible says something different. And no sooner had that birth pang quelled than India and Pakistan developed nuclear weapons. Now, when I was a little boy in New York, the key to Khrushchev came to the United Nations during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And he took off his shoe and began pounding it on the podium in the UN and said, we will bury you, we will bury you. Well, within a matter of months, he was gone. The Soviet Politburo said, we cannot have a madman with his finger on the button. During the Watergate crisis, in the Yom Kippur War, Nixon called the stage three alert against the Soviet Union, a nuclear alert. He was trying to exploit the water, he was trying to exploit the conflict in the Middle East to save his own neck politically. He was getting drunk out of his mind, he was taking tranquilizers, and Kissinger and Haig were trying to keep this madman, Nixon, under control. Nixon was an absolute madman, completely corrupt, totally evil man. And they said, we, we can't let this nut have his finger on the button. In no time, the American establishment and his own party, the Republicans, got rid of him. You cannot have a nut with his finger on the button. At least the Soviets thought somewhat rationally. The Americans thought rationally. Islam and Hinduism do not think rationally. To a Muslim, he'll push the button. The only assurance of salvation is to die in a jihad anyway, to be shahadi. To a Hindu, he'll be reincarnated, maybe next time he'll come back as a Brahmin, push the button. You understand? Now it's no longer superpowers that have these weapons, now it's crazy people. The guy in North Korea, at Minajad, people who, are, who don't think rationally. Well, this seems to be a temporary respite. All the Iron Curtain came down, the Cold War is over. But then it something goes back even more dangerous. That's the way it is. That's the way the last days is. And Jeremiah went through a period like this where he realized it was hopeless. There was no hope. There was nothing he or anybody could do beyond a certain point that was going to remedy the situation. Things had gone too far for too long. But there was Yechal. There was a painful waiting with a certain expectation. Oh, I hope things get better. Oh, I wish things would improve. Or... The closer we get to the return of Christ, the less hope there is. In the sense of, I hope, I wish. But the closer we get to Christ, the more Yechal increases. You wait with a certain sense of expectation through a season of painful duration, waiting for God to do something. Yechal. Now we can only understand what Jeremiah is writing in Lamentations by reading his first book first. Let's look at some highlights of the book of Jeremiah. Turn with me, please, to the book of Jeremiah, his first book. In chapter 1, verse 12, you have a word play. He sees an almond tree, a shekel. And that word sounds like a word for word. The Lord said to me, you've seen well, I'm watching over my word to perform it. There were many false prophets having false words. Jeremiah was the one who had the true word. In the last days, the same thing happens. You've got the odd individual like Jeremiah or Baruch telling the truth, but there are literally thousands and thousands of false prophets prophesying a lie to the people. 
Now again, A is to B as B is to C. It is not just about the last days of Judah. It's about the last days. Verse 13 speaks of the rejection of Christ. The prophecy about Israel and the Jews. They would reject the fountain of living water. They reject the Messiah. And the people couldn't believe they were that bad. Verse 23 of chapter 2. How can you say I'm not defiled? I've not gone after Baalus. How can you say that? Look at some of the main preachers today. They're doing the same things. In this country, it's Ray McCauley, the money preacher. He divorced his wife, goes into an adulterous marriage with another woman. The New Testament calls that man an adulterer. He's living in adultery. He's in an adulterous marriage by New Testament definition. How can you say this about him? He's a man of God. He's living in immorality. Paula White, another false prophetess, she's now getting divorced from her second husband. And she does seminars for women on spiritual empowerment. <laughs> Spiritually empowered to do what? Get divorced? Crazy. Totally nuts. They can't see how they're not defiled and they've not gone after balls. I've explained this before. The Baal thing is a big deal. Baal is the Hebrew word for husband, master, and owner. Yahweh was Israel's Baal, the same as Christ is the bridegroom of the church. What the Bible does, both Testaments, is it calls idolatry adultery. Like Hosea, daughter of Zion who played the harlot, or the epistle of James, calling worldly churches adulteresses. When the church or in Israel was after other Baals, it's, the idolatry is called adultery. Remember, it's the Hebrew word for husband, master, and owner. Your husband is your maker. Yahweh was the true Baal. But the Canaanites had their Baal. And they, they even had a resurrection myth that their Baal rose from the dead every spring. It even looks like Christianity in some way. You got a ball, we got a ball, it must be the same ball. They had religious holidays the same days as the Hebrews. It looks so much the same. That's why God told Moses, be sure to observe all I command you. It's not the similarities that are important, it's the differences. You can have one digit, one zero or one one out of sequence in a software program, and it will malfunction. It doesn't matter if you have 5,000 lines of information that are all right. One character is out of sequence. It's not going to work. You can have a perfectly healthy human being, but all you need, all you need is one nucleotide, one nucleotide, to be out of sequence, one gene, and you have Down syndrome. <laughs> but the rest of it's all, it's just not like that. A counterfeit always tries to look real. Well, this is what Jesus warned about. <coughs> Many will come in my name. They come in his name. We're the church of Jesus Christ, the Latter-day Saints, Mormons. Well, our Jesus is the monogenes, the only begotten of the Father. Their Jesus is the half-brother of Satan. They have a different, as the brother of Satan. They have a different Jesus. Our Jesus says he will not come back to earth physically except the way he left. If they say he has, he's in the wilderness, don't go there. He's in the inner rooms, don't go there. He will not come back to earth physically except the way he left to the Mount of Olives. The Roman Catholic Church says in the Mass, Jesus returns physically under the appearances of bread and wine. That's idolatry. They have another Jesus Christ. The Jesus of the Roman Catholic <laughs> Eucharist, they call the Blessed Sacrament, is not our Jesus. Yeah. It's a heathen idol. It's not our Jesus. It's what Jesus called eating food sacrifice to idols. It's total idolatry. He said he will not come back physically. The consumption of blood. The Catholics believe in Jesus, which Jesus? Mormons believe in Jesus, which Jesus? Allah! As a common noun, Allah is a word for God in Arabic. El being another one. But Allah is a name for God, small g. In Arabic. 
But as a proper noun, Allah is the name of the Nabataean moon god. That's why you see the moon on top of the crescent. Well, because you can say, call God Allah in Arabic, that's true as a common noun. But when you call it the name of God, Allah is not Yahweh. Mm -hmm. They're two different Allahs. One is the Nabataean moon god, a demon idol, and the other is the god of scripture, the god of Israel. But we're being told Muslims have the same God as Christians and Jews. No, they don't. No, they don't. Different Baal. If you find two people in the Durban telephone book named Robert Jones, does it mean they're the same person? In Latin America, Jesus, Jesus, was every common name. Every common name. There are tens of thousands of people in Mexico City named Jesus. Doesn't mean the same Jesus. Many will come in my name. Well, that was the problem with Baal. You got a Baal, we got a Baal, we must have the same Baal. They began mixing. Trying to identify the God of the Bible with these other Baals. Trying to identify the Mormon Jesus or the Roman Catholic Eucharist Jesus or some other one with the Jesus of the Bible. And they couldn't see it. How can you say I'm the Baal? I've not gone after the Baals. And it gets worse. Jeremiah gets frustrated. And he's telling them in chapter 3, return faithless Israel, begging them to repent. And it goes on and on and on, and he's begging them. Chapter 4, verse 14, he's begging them. God is beseeching his people to repent, warning them what's going to happen. But by the time you get to chapter 4, verse 22, God says something through Jeremiah. For my people are foolish. They know me not. They are stupid children. They have no understanding. They are shrewd to do evil. But to do good, they do not know. My people, doesn't say they're not his people, are stupid. What are you, stupid? <clears throat> Sounds very crude, very strong language. How can you call God's people stupid? I didn't. God called his people stupid. But the word here for stupid does not refer to a natural lack of intelligence. Jesus warned if you call people that, rock that empty head. If you demean somebody for a natural sense of intelligence, you're in danger of going to hell. You never demean somebody for a natural sense of intelligence, a natural lack of intelligence. And also, a rock that the fool says in his heart there's no God, it has the implication of saying that somebody is godless. You don't call somebody raka, but here the word is not that. The word here is adhir. What it means is they pervert their logic to justify that which common sense and scripture tells them to be wrong. They pervert their logic to justify that which common sense and scripture tells them to be wrong. We looked at this last night, if you were there, with, with the uh, Eloga. What, are you stupid? Well, he goes on like this. In chapter 5, Jeremiah says, in verse 30, an appalling and horrible thing has happened in the land. The prophets prophesied falsely. The priests, the Levites, the clergy, rule by their own authority. My people love it so, but what will you do in the end of it? People are following men and women who are proven false prophets. By biblical definition, those who predict things through predictively in God's name that failed to happen are false prophets. We're forbidden to follow them. The word of God says you are a rebel. You're in rebellion against God if you follow people who predict things don't happen. I can prove Cindy Jacobs is a false prophetess. I can prove Benny Hinn is a false prophet. I can prove Rick uh, Joyner is a false prophet, and a bubble like can prove Benny Hinn is a false prophet. I can give you documented predictions they made in God's name that failed to happen, yet people will still follow them. I went up to Benny Hinn once in Hawaii about two years ago, a year and a half ago, and I told him right to the States. He didn't deny it, but he wouldn't deal with it. They're false prophets. The prophets prophesied falsely and my people love it so. The clergy rule by their own authority. They're no longer ruling by the authority of the word of God. 
It's their own opinions, their own ideas. That's what Laodicea <coughs> means, Laodicea, people's opinions. And the people love it. There must be a market for their product. Give the people what they want. The true product will give the people what they need. Now we have a tape, I think it's available in South Africa, called the Birdcage. I don't know if you can get it here, but the same chapter, verse 27, like a cage of birds, so their houses are filled with deceit. They become rich. There's a financial motive in this, but they're like birds in a cage. Now, there are a number of reasons I don't believe in evolution. One of them is, if Darwinism was right, it should be our nearest phylogenetic relatives who can say human words. Specifically, apes should be able to say human words. The only species that can say human words are birds. According to Guinness's world records, some birds can say over 50 human words. Some birds can actually say over 50 human words. Discernible human words. Incredible that a bird can say, if, if, if Darwinism was right, it should be apes, but it isn't, it's birds. They can actually say human words. The problem is, they don't know what they're saying. <laughs> they don't know what the words mean. <laughs> Well, what was happening in Jeremiah's day is something that happened in the last days. The people who follow the false prophets become like birds in a cage. They repeat cliches, but they don't know what they're talking about. Ah, we have the victory! Ah, ah, name it and claim it! Ah, ah. And if you get the name of Jesus! Ah, ah, and say it if I don't receive it, hallelujah! Ah, ah. <laughs> they become like mindless birds, parakeets. <laughs> They're birds in a cage, you know. Raymond is not a church, it's a bird cage with a cross on the top. It's a bird cage. They're not disciples, they're parakeets. Now we have a tape explaining how this works. They get like birds in a cage. And we're warned about people who say peace, peace, because there is no peace in chapter 6, verse 14, something Jeremiah keeps coming back to. And again, remember, what happens in Jeremiah's day happens in the last days. What does Paul tell us? Same thing. When men say peace and security, then the end will come, right? Well, there's a reason you have today people are following Rick Warren's Global Peace Plan. It's an acronym, his peace plan. It is an acronym. P is... Partnering with churches. E, equipping new leaders to follow his ideas. Okay. A, assisting the poor. C, caring for the sick. And E, education. That's his peace plan. That's the purpose-driven peace plan for world peace. Now, in Jeremiah's day, people had a peace plan. They were saying, peace, peace, but there is no peace. Paul warns us the last days that things will happen. There'll be a peace plan. When men say peace and security, then the end will come. Now, God has a peace plan. God has a peace plan. Let's look at God's peace plan very briefly. Look, Isaiah 52. Verse 7. How lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. Bisorah in Hebrew. Evangelion in Greek. Gospel in English. The gospel of peace. That's what it says in Hebrew. Isaiah 52, 7. In Ephesians chapter 6. Therefore, shod your feet with the shoes of the gospel of peace. In God's peace plan, peace comes through people getting saved, through evangelism, through people being saved and discipled. Okay? Jesus said, my peace I give you, not as the world gives you. Now, Rick Warren's peace plan is not... Evangelism. 
Given the fact he has two E's, you'd think at least one of them would be evangelism. <laughs> no, it's partnering with churches, equipping new leaders to believe purpose-driven, assisting the poor, caring for the sick in education, a social gospel. No, I believe in assisting the poor. We have orphanages here in Africa for AIDS children. I believe in caring for the sick. We have, <laughs> we have to give those kids antiretrovirals every day. Chris is one of them. I believe in education. But that's not going to save a soul. And it's not going to bring world peace. This is his peace plan. Now I know that God has his peace plan. Rick Warren has his. Whose peace plan are people following? Rick Warren's. Well, that's exactly what was happening in the days of Jeremiah. They were saying, peace, peace, but there is no peace. They had their own peace plan. They were listening to Rick Warren. They were reading purpose driven instead of the word of God. What happens in the last days of Judah happens in the last days. You understand it's the same thing happening again? And Jeremiah understood this. Now, if you don't know, the Hebrew word for peace is shalom. Okay? It comes from the infinitive of the Hebrew verb. Le Shalem, meaning to pay, to fill, to fulfill. Jesus said, My peace I give you, Shlomi and Yatendahem, no come out with my peace I give you, not like the world. The world's idea of peace is an absence of conflict, an absence of war. Or as Dr. Samuel Johnson said, a period of preparation and deception between two wars. That's peace. That's not God's peace. God's peace is shalom. We have shalom because the Messiah came to Le Shalem to pay the price for our sin, to fill us with his spirit and to fulfill the law of God, the Torah, that no Jew and no man can keep. We have shalom because the Messiah came to Le Shalem to pay the price for our sin, to fill us with his spirit and to fulfill the law of God, the Torah. Okay. You can be in the biggest conflict of your life, the biggest crisis of your life, and have shalom. Amen. Amen. <laughs> now, ultimately, God's shalom will include the absence of conflict. When Jesus comes and there's a millennial reign, the nations will indeed beat their spears into pruning hooks. It will include the absence of conflict, ultimately, when Christ returns. But that's not what it is. <clears throat> You can have shalom now, even though we live in a world of war. You can have shalom. Now that's God's peace plan. Rick Warren has his own. But what these people don't know is, it's the same exact garbage that happened in the book of Jeremiah. The same garbage. Paul warns us, in the last days, they'll be saying peace, peace, when there is no peace. They'll be saying peace and security, then the end will come. It's amazing that, 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 that the New Testament warned us about Rick Warren and, and, and people like him. Social gospel. It's a Christless gospel. A gospel that doesn't preach Christ is Christless. You've got a man from this country who says he loves Israel, supports Israel. Well, I'm grateful for that, except that he doesn't believe Jews need to be saved, doesn't believe they need to be evangelized. I love you, Jew, go to hell. That's what he's saying. That kind of love Jews don't need. Jews need their Messiah Yeshua. Amen. Crazy. This, this guy, is, is Malcolm Henning in this country, actually put out a tape here in Durban where he said, Jesus Christ never came to die. Hmm. Jesus said, for this purpose I have come. Well, you either believe Malcolm Henning or you believe Jesus Christ. You either believe Rick Warren's peace plan or you believe Jesus Christ's peace plan. Well, who are people choosing to follow? they rather follow man than follow God. Mm -hmm. This is exactly what happened in the days of Jeremiah. Mm -hmm. But let's look. <coughs> it then got to the point in chapter 7, verse 16, something that Jeremiah repeated again. He's praying for these people. Lord, open their eyes and make them listen. But as for you, do not pray for this people. 
Don't lift up a cry or a prayer. God told Jeremiah <coughs> to stop praying for these people. I only speak for myself. I don't speak for anybody but myself. Some years ago, I believe the Lord led me personally. I'm not saying anybody else. <coughs> the Lord led me personally. Don't even pray for Betty Hinn anymore. <clears throat> now, who said it for me? Well, let's walk. Chapter 8. <coughs> They're all greedy for gra all greedy for gain, verse 10. From the prophet to the priest. They heal the brokenness of the daughter of my people superficially. Once more are saying, peace, peace, but there is no peace. Thank you. What's it about? Greed, money. Greed for power and wealth. And prostituting the word of God to get it. Jeremiah goes on. Gets to chapter 10. Verse 8. And he says, they are altogether stupid and foolish. The delusion of their wood and their idol. He's saying that they're stupid and foolish. Again, using that same term, stupid. Strong language. Stupid. Yes. They pervert their logic to justify that which is wrong. Verse 14 of that chapter. Every man is stupid, the void of knowledge. Going after these images. Now you see people claiming to be Protestant who are sanctioning the veneration of Mary. You have the emerging church, Brian McLaren, Rick Warren's partner. They're burning incense before graven images and icons, things copied from the Eastern Orthodox Church. They're going into idolatry. You shall not make an image of anything on heaven above or earth beneath in order to bow down to them or serve them, but they're doing it with the emergent church. Postmodernism and mysticism. Every man is stupid, devoid of knowledge. They're altogether stupid and foolish. Why are you stupid? How can you believe in the American church? How can you believe in Rick Warren? What, are you stupid? How can you believe in McLaren? Are you stupid? Again, they're stupid. They're stupid people. That's not what I'm saying. That's what God says. They are stupid. Anybody who believes the American church is stupid. Anybody who believes Rick Warren's peace plan is stupid. Not a natural lack of intelligence. I can handle that but they're perverting their God-given intelligence to justify something that is plainly unscriptural and illogical. They are stupid by choice. And Jeremiah gets persecuted for saying these things. Verse 20 he says, Let me see thy vengeance on them, for I have committed my cause. By the time he gets to the book of Lamentations, he will have seen God's vengeance upon them. But when it really happened, he took absolutely no delight in it. He was sorry it happened. It's something he tried to prevent. It's something he didn't want to happen. It's something he did everything he could to see not happen. Well, I know the way the Western world is heading. I know the way the church is heading. I know what it's going to come to. It's going to go the same place that Judah went, Babylon. Christendom will go into the Babylon, Babylon the Great. The same as Israel went to Babylon. Judah went to Babylon. Baxter Christendom will go to Babylon the Great. I know it's going to happen. Seven times the New Testament calls the church the temple. The temple is going to be destroyed again because of the rejection of the word of God. It's going to happen again. A is to B as B is to C. It's going to happen again. 
another Babylonian captivity, another destruction of the temple, as it were. Now, there are certain meanings of these things for Israel and the Jews, for sure, but the principles apply to the church. Look at chapter 5 again. Verse 4, I said, they're only the poor, the foolish. They don't know the way of the Lord or the ordinance of God. I'll go to the great and speak to them. They know the way of the Lord and the ordinance of God. But they too, with one accord, have broken the yoke and burst the bonds. He says, look, the people are being misled by their leaders. They don't know. People can't see what's wrong. They only believe what their pastors tell them from the pulpit. I know what I'll do. I'll go to the pastors. I'll go to the leaders. I'll speak to the superintendents of their denominations. I'll show them from the Bible how it's wrong. But they were no better. In fact, they were worse. They too, with one accord, have broken the yoke and burst the bonds. It doesn't matter anymore. Keep away from Jeremiah. He's speaking against purpose driven. He's speaking against the global peace plan. Keep away from Jeremiah. But then it continues. Look at chapter 11. Comes back again, verse 14. Therefore, do not pray for this people, nor lift up a cry or prayer for them. I'll not listen when they call to me because of their disaster. The disaster is coming. Don't even pray for them. <coughs> Don't even pray for them. Chapter 14, verse 13. Oh, Lord God, I said, look, the prophets are telling them, you'll not see sword, you'll not see famine. I'll give you lasting peace in this place. Then the Lord said to me, the prophets are prophesying falsehood in my name. I've neither sent them nor commanded them, nor spoken to them. They're prophesying to you a false vision, divination, futility, and the deception of their own minds. Understand what they're prophesying? A false vision. A delirium. They think it's from God, but it's something that's false. The vision is not coming from God. Divination. There's an occult element to what these people do. <coughs> Futility. <coughs> They're telling people things that are absolutely no way going to happen. And the deception of their own minds. They cut the stuff up in their own head. Just think of Cindy Jacobs when she prophesied how Zimbabwe was going to blossom and be the garden spot of Africa. The diametric opposite happened of what she said. I can tell you how to know what's going to happen prophetically. Find out what Cindy Jacobs' prophecy is and figure on the diametric opposite. I tell you in a better way. Rick Joyner wrote a book, The Harvest. He said how communism was going to be triumphant for all this. Six months later, the Berlin Wall came down and the Soviet Union collapsed. Figure out what Rick, what, what Rick Joyner is prophesying and figure on the opposite. Whatever they say, figure on the opposite, because that's what seems to happen. Yet people will still go see Cindy Jake. I bet you if she came to this city, to Durban or to Peter Maritzburg, she would draw thousands. The prophets prophesy falsely, my people love it so. But what will you do in the end? You see people going to see the... What, are you stupid? Yeah, you're stupid. Yeah. You're stupid. God says they are stupid. This is the background of what was happening. The heart of Jeremiah's polemic, however, against the false prophets is found in chapter 23. Go to chapter 23. And it opens in verse 1. Oi la roi. Woe to the shepherds. The Hebrew word for shepherd is also the Hebrew word for pastor. The Greek word for shepherd is the Greek word for pastor. Pastor, Hebrew, ro'eh, one who sees over the sheep. Adonai ro'i, literally Yahweh ro'i. The Lord is Yahweh is my shepherd. Greek episcopal, like scope, the one called microscope, 
a telescope. The heart of Jeremiah's polemic against the false prophets does not open by warning about the false prophets. It opens by warning against the false pastors. The problem primarily is not false prophets. There's always been wolves. And there have always been wolves in sheep's clothing. In the last days, their numbers increased substantially. But they've always been around. The problem is not the wolves. Not even the wolves in sheep's clothing. The problem are the pastors who will not protect the sheep from them. John chapter 10. You've got three kinds of pastors. Good shepherds are like Jesus, Peter tells us. They will lay the light down to the sheep. Then you've got wolves. Pastors who are wolves in sheep's clothing. But then you have the third category. Hirelings. Most pastors today are not good shepherds. Neither are most of them Wolves, some are. Theo Rembrandt's a wolf. Ray McCauley's a wolf. The wolves in sheep's clothing. But most pastors are not wolves. Most pastors today are hirelings. It is their job. They're hired. Their priorities are their salary, their pension, their retirement fund their accommodation allowance, their credentials with the denomination, their standing in the community, anything and everything but the word of God and the welfare of the sheep. They are hired. How do you tell the difference between a pastor and a hireling? Jesus tells us in John 10, a hireling will not protect the sheep from the wolves. The problem primarily are not the false prophets. It is the pastors who will not protect the sheep from them. The problem is not Rick Warren. The problem are the pastors who have his book in their church. That's how it begins. Let's just look at some of these guys. Verse 16 of chapter 23. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Do not listen to the words of the prophets who are prophesying to you. They are leading you into futility. They speak a vision of their own imagination, not from the mouth of the Lord. Benny Hinn said God was going to destroy all the homosexuals in 1996. They gain more political power every year. They have the right to adopt children now in England. And they bring the children up to be homosexual. Benny Hinn told us they wouldn't even be around anymore after 1996. Don't listen to the words that the prophets were prophesying falsely. <clears throat> they keep saying to those who despise me, the Lord has said you will have peace. There's Rick Warren. Calamity will not come upon you. Kingdom now theology. But then it goes on. Now look at verse 20. The anger of the Lord will not turn back until he's performed and carried out the purposes of his heart. In the last days, you will clearly understand it. In other words, he's not just prophesying for his own time. He's prophesying for our time. Do you see verse 20? It happens again. The same way. Then it continues. Verse 25. I have heard what the prophets have said who prophesied falsely in my name. I had a dream. I had a dream. How long was there anything in the hearts of the prophets who prophesied falsehood? Even these reports of the deception of their own heart? I had a dream! Now the Bible does say in the last days there will be visions and dreams. But they will be biblically based. The prophecies will happen. The predictions will come true if they're really from God. I had a dream, I had a vision, the Lord gave me the... No, you had a hallucination. You had a delusion. You're too drunk on spiritual pride to know it. 
just like the liars who told us Toronto and Pensacola were revivals. Did any revival come from Toronto or Pensacola? No, they lied. They have a lying spirit. Well, these same people went to Toronto and Pensacola. Aren't they the same ones who are into purpose driven? Same churches, right? The same ones who listen to the Kansas City false prophets, the homosexual alcoholic Paul Kane and his sponsor Mike Bickle. Aren't they the same ones that's doing it now? Yes. Same ones at the Alpha. Is it the same one? Yeah. Always the same ones. They go from lie to lie. They go from lie to lie. They're like politicians. If they couldn't lie, they wouldn't have anything to say. But let's look. The prophet who has a dream in verse 28, maybe they his dream. But let him who has my word speak my word in truth. What does straw have in common with grain? If you come with us to Israel, we'll show you the kind of wheat that still grows above the Sea of Galilee, which is the wheat basket of Israel, an upper Galilee. It's the same exact color as weeds, pears. It looks just like it at a distance. The only difference is one is tares and one is wheat. One you can make grain from it, the other it's useless straw. You can't even use it as fodder for animals. It's garbage. But it looks like it. So you get up close and you see there's no grits. It's not even real. It's the same color. These people have dreams, visions, prophecies that appear to be scriptural. But when you look up close, they're not scriptural. And if you don't know scripture, you won't know the difference. So what they wind up doing is replacing their visions and their dreams for the Word of God. The Word of God becomes replaced by these delusions. And the pastors let it happen. Well, it goes on and on and on, and Jeremiah sees what's happening, that Babylon is coming, and the last days are the same. First people get in bed with the Pope, the Pope is in bed with the Dalai Lama. I have a picture of Pope John Paul II kissing the Koran, a book that says God has no son. And Satan has raised up liars in the church, deceivers like Chuck Colson, saying Roman Catholicism is biblical and the Pope is a Christian. What, a man who kisses a book that says God has no son? It says in 1 John, if you deny the Father's Son relationship, you're Antichrist. Chuck Colson is a man who has the spirit of Antichrist. People think he's a Christian. Pat Robinson is another one. You get in bed with the Pope, who's he in bed with? Islam? Witch doctors? Some Gormans? Yes, he is. When he came to Africa, he paid tribute to some Gormans. Babylon is coming. The church is going into captivity, the same as the Jews. Jeremiah saw it coming. And when he tried to warn people, they not only rejected him, but persecuted him. He even tried to kill him. The last days are the same. Those who see what's happening and who understand what's happening and try to warn others, you're going to be rejected. They'll kick you out of that church. They'll kick you out of it. They'll persecute you. Some of them will even try to kill you. But it happens. The temple gets destroyed and the judgment comes. And it's in this aftermath that Jeremiah begins to write his lamentations. The most miserable, depressing book of the Bible, the most miserable, depressing thing you will ever read in your life. It opens with tears and lamentations, and it closes with tears and lamentations. He sees Jerusalem in ruins. Now remember, he's a picture of Christ. Jesus mourned over Jerusalem. He wept over Jerusalem in Matthew 23, remember? Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who stones the prophets. Jesus wept over Jerusalem. Well, he's foreshadowed by Jeremiah. 
how the lowly city sits. It was filled with people. Now it's become like a widow. It was once great among the nations. Now it's a forced laborer. He goes on telling the story. She's mocked in verse 7. Jerusalem sinned greatly. Therefore she's become an unclean thing. All who honored her despise her. It's mocked. Don't think the church is not mocked. When unsaved people see the money preachers on TV, they mock it. The name of Jesus is mocked. The church of Christ is mocked. Unsaved people see right through those money preachers. The sons of darkness are shrewder in the ways of the world than the sons of light. Unsaved people have more discernment than Christians. Unsaved people know what Ray McCauley is. Unsaved people know what Benny Hinn is. Unsaved people know what TBN is. If by the grace of Jesus I was not already born again, and I saw Kenneth Copeland or one of these clowns on television, I would think born again is a household joke. I think it was a mocking thing. I think it was ridiculous. It's only by the grace of God that I know that that is not born again. That's what the world thinks born again is. Those common, those false prophets, those liars. And my people love it so. But what will you do in the end? She's mocked. But once the judgment happens, although he cried out for vengeance, he's not happy when the justice of God comes. And he goes into the third person. The first. Verse 12. He goes into the third person. Is it nothing to all you who pass this way look and see my pain, which was severely dealt out to me, which the Lord who inflicted on me in the day of his fierce anger? From my high he sent fire into my bones, and it prevailed over them. He spread a net for my feet. He's turned me back. He's made me desolate, faint all day long. He is not immune from the suffering of the people. You cannot prophesy to a people unless you identify with them. Remember Daniel? Confessed his sin and the sin of his people? Jesus took the sin of Israel. Had he not taken the sin of Israel, he could not have redeemed Israel. You must be identified with those you speak to. At least to a degree. You're very angry. I get very angry at George Bush. To me, this man says he's a Christian, but he puts a Koran in the White House. A book that says God has no son. I detest him. I think he's an evil man. I pray for him every day because the Bible tells me to pray for him, but I think he is evil. <clears throat> he forced Israel to give up its covenant land for the Muslims in Gaza. Mm -hmm. Now he's trying to force them to give up more because he's owned by oil companies. He's in bed with the Saudi Arabians who behead Christians. To me, he's just an evil, wicked man. I pray for him, but he's an evil, wicked man. But I don't want to see God's judgment come on America because of him. I believe what's happened to this country is unspeakable. This country has given up one evil for another. It has given up one cancer for another. It's given up one form of racism for another. It's replaced one evil with another. Now again, we have two orphanages in this country for AIDS children, mainly black children. Do you know what it's like? Every microbiologist in the world, every microbiologist in the world who has looked at HIV says it's a retroviral infection. But as a political decision, as a political decision, the president of this country says, no, it isn't. The health minister tells people with AIDS to eat African potato. She's a drunk who gets arrested for, for stealing from people in hospitals. The deputy president was in charge of this nation's AIDS control program. When he's on trial for rape, he said, yes, he had sex with this woman, but he knows he's not HIV because he took a shower. 
What do you think a kid in Soweto is going to think? I can sleep around. As long as I take a shower, I won't get AIDS. This makes me angry. These are evil. They're killing kids. But I don't want to see Johannesburg burned to the ground because of its government. Great Britain is the same. They made a law. A law where you must allow homosexuals and lesbians to adopt babies and bring them up to be homosexuals or lesbians. And if you don't do it, you will be prosecuted for a hate crime. That is Tony Blair. He's evil. He's an evil man. He's a son of the devil. His wife is worse. But I do not want to see London destroyed or Cape Town destroyed or Washington or New York destroyed because of the leaders. But like Jeremiah, I come to realize nations get the leaders they deserve. Mm -hmm. But I also come to realize something else. Jeremiah warns first about the priests, the clergy. The reason South Africa, America, and Britain, now remember, South Africa, America, and Britain are like Israel in a sense. They all have a biblical heritage. They all have a strong biblical heritage, more than most other nations. In fact, more than any other nations. You realize that South Africa, Great Britain, and the United States have more biblical heritage than any other nations in the world, except for Israel. And they've all turned against it. They're even more guilty. Jesus called the church to be salt and light. These nations have failed morally, and their governments have failed morally, because their churches have failed morally. Of course you're going to have scum in the parliament when you have scum in the pulpit. You understand? When there is scum, backslidden scum in the pulpit, what do you expect to have in the White House or the parliament? If the clergy are out of the buck, what do you expect politicians to do? Yeah. This is exactly what Jeremiah was up against. Exactly what's happening now. And he laments. Zion stretches out her hand in verse 17, but there's no one to comfort her. The Lord is righteous. I rebelled against his command. Here now, people, behold my pain, but nobody wants to. And in verse 20 of chapter 1, he calls out to God, I'm in distress, my spirit is troubled. My heart is overturned within me. He says he's been rebellious. Notice the righteous man is aware of his own sin. The unrighteous, as far as they're concerned, they've done nothing wrong. Righteous people, people who seek God, are aware of their own sin and confess it. The ones who are unrighteous won't acknowledge their sin. But then it shifts back. Back to the third person, chapter 2, verse 1. How the Lord has covered the daughter of Zion with the cloud of his anger. It says in verse 5, the Lord has become like an enemy. Swallowed up Israel. He swallowed up all its places. Referring to the destruction of the temple in verse 7, the Lord has rejected his altar. He's abandoned his sanctuary. The false prophets kept saying, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, we won't see judgment. And then in verse 10, the elders of the daughter of Zion stood on the ground. They are silent. They throw dust on their heads. They gird themselves with sackcloth. Yet they repent after it's too late. They repent after it's too late. The time to repent of sexual immorality is before you become HIV infected, not after. They'll all repent after it's too late. Verse 14, he tells them, Your prophets have seen for you false and foolish visions. They've not exposed your iniquity so as to restore you from captivity. But they have seen for you false and misleading oracles. These people will know. One day they will know that Benny Hinn is a false prophet. One day they will know that Chuck Colson is a deceiver. One day they will know Rick Warren is a false teacher. One day they will know this. 
but it will be too late. But this only adds to the frustration of those who see it coming ahead of time. In verse 20 of chapter 2, he says, See, O Lord, and look, with whom hast thou dealt thus? Should women eat their offspring? The little ones who were born healthy, should priest and prophet be slain? Can you imagine such a thing? People eating their own children. Well, if the society will abort its own children, why would it eat them? Just a natural progression. But then he says in chapter 3, even when I cry out and call for help, he shuts out my prayers. God told them not to pray for these people anymore. Verse 14, I've become a laughing stock to all my people. They're mocking song all day. When he's trying to warn them, all they did was mock him. Those who are telling the truth today will be mocked. They will mock you. And it goes on. Again, he becomes identified with Christ in chapter 3, verse 30. Let him give his cheek to the smiter. Let him be filled with reproach. And he goes on. Calling the people to repentance. Verse 40, let us examine and probe our ways. Let us return to the Lord. He's still calling them to repent, to admit that they transgressed and rebelled in the first. In verse 42, he goes back to the first person. We've transgressed and rebelled, but thou was not pardoned. Thou was covered thyself with anger. Verse 49, my eyes pour down unceasingly without stopping. My enemies, without cause, come to be like a bird in verse 52. Notice he himself is not immune. Yet he realizes, because he was a righteous man in verse 58, the Lord did plead his soul's case and has redeemed his life. It was too late for the nation, but it was not too late for him. It's too late for the backslidden church, for the apostate church. But it's not too late for the faithful people in it. But it won't be easy. He goes on. Verse 6, the iniquity of the daughter of my people, in chapter 4, verse 6, the iniquity of the daughter of my people is greater than the sin of Sodom. Desmond Tutu wants to ordain lesbian priests as the Anglican Communion. In Britain, the same backslidden denominations that are against Israel or dating homosexuals. The United Reformed Church, the Presbyterian Church, the Methodist Church, the Church of Scotland, the Church of England, they're all ordaining homosexuals. I'm trying to prove how righteous they are by standing up for the poor Muslims who persecute Christians by ganging up on Israel, the one nation in the Middle East that protects the religious freedom and human rights of Christians. There's one country in the Middle East that protects the religious freedom and human rights of Arab Christians, that's Israel. That's the one the Presbyterians, the Church of England, the Methodists, the United Reformed Church all want to gang up on, not the Lutherans. God sees this injustice. But which churches are ordaining the homosexuals and lesbians? The same ones. Perverts. Anti Semitic sex pervert churches. Last week, the Lutherans began their campaign to boycott Israel in America. Well, given the fact that Luther said every Jew should be hoarded into a corral and forced to confess Christ at the point of the knife, given the fact that Luther's last sermon was, we, we, the German nation, are to blame if we do not murder the Jews to prove we are Christians. That didn't surprise me. The Lutherans were Nazis before they were Nazis. And my Tom Hitler quoted Luther at length. If there was ever a man who began good and ended evil, it was Martin Luther. I find that very frightening, because he began good. A man who inspired Hitler, a man who Hitler quoted at length, 
The man who inspired the Holocaust in the Third Reich was the same man who kicked off the Reformation. But let's look. The sin is greater than sorrow. Verse 10, the hands of compassionate women boiled their own children. They became food for that. Can you imagine women boiling their own children to have something to eat? It happened. Because of her sins in verse 13, because of the sins of her prophets and the iniquities of her priests. Then we read in verse 17, looking for help was useless. There's no hope. No tikvah. Verse 18, our days drew near, our days were finished, our end had come. And it was on and on and on. The pain for their drinking water. Princes were hung by hands. Elders were not respected in verse 12. Slaves rule over us. And he ends in a gasp of desperation. Restore to thee, O Lord, that we may be restored. Renew our days as days of old. Unless thou hast utterly rejected us and are exceedingly angry with us. Why does thou forget us forever? Why does thou forsake us so long? It opens and closes with despair. A faint suggestion at the end that maybe God will restore our day sometime. But verse after verse, all he can do is lament. And his lamentation was made worse by his frustration because he saw it coming and tried to prevent it. and was persecuted and rejected for doing so. Same as Jesus swept over Jerusalem. He saw what was coming and tried to prevent it, but they wouldn't listen. And so Jesus swept over Jerusalem, as did Jeremiah. It is utterly hopeless. It gets to the point there's no stopping it. God says, don't even pray for it. Don't think that's not going to happen to Christianity. The same thing happens to the apostate church. Babylon. Having said that, although there is no tikva, there is Yahab. Exactly in the middle of this book. In the most depressing book of the Bible. The most miserable, upsetting, tragic thing you could ever imagine. Expressed as a literary form. He says, verse 19, remember my affliction. My wandering, the world would have been in this. Surely my soul remembers and is bowed back within me. This I recall to mind. Therefore I have hope. No, he has yachav. The word in Hebrew is yachav. He doesn't hope this is going to get better. But he has an expectation of a coming day when God will do something. And he goes on in verse 22, and he says, The Lord's loving kindness indeed never ceases. His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion and my soul. Therefore I have tikva. In verse 31, the Lord will not reject forever. For if he causes grief, then he will have compassion according to his abundant kindness. Now from these verses, we get two of the most probably beautiful hymns in Christian hymnody. We get great as thy faithfulness. We get the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercy never comes to an end. They're new every morning, new every morning, great as thy faithfulness. And we also get, 
Mane Manata, Mane Manata, Shahaira has the Hanashir, Kolmak Sorayina Tata Bejepa, Mane Manata, Yahi Mati. Great is thy faithfulness, born unto me. We get these two magnificent hymns from the heart of the most miserable, depressing thing perhaps ever written. In fact, it must be because it is divinely inspired miserable. It is Holy Spirit authored anguish. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. Right in the middle of this misery. No, I can offer you no hope. I don't think things are going to get better permanently. Intermittent periods of respite, perhaps, at best. But hope? It's hopeless. But I can offer you Yechah. I can offer you a definite expectation, even though we must painfully endure in waiting for it. That's what it comes to. Mane e manata, mane e manata, shacha kayira has de halashir, a kol maksorai lina kata be shefa, mane e manata. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercy never comes to an end. God bless. Amen. Thank you.